On January 7, 1996, a historic blizzard hit eastern New York, covering the area with over two feet of snow. That evening, Tom Dorr Sr., a volunteer firefighter, received a call asking him to come into the station and help with any emergencies that might occur. Tom agreed to go, but he never showed up. The next day, several firefighters went searching for Tom. They soon discovered his body in a park close to his home. He'd been brutally murdered shortly after responding to the fire station call. For years, it seemed like Tom's case had gone cold. But then, in 2001, police announced that they had identified two suspects. Unfortunately, those two people have never been arrested, and Tom's case still remains unsolved. Hey everyone, my name is Derek Lavasser. I'm a former police detective and licensed private investigator. Each week I'll be covering unsolved cases in story format, and then I'll give you my perspective on the investigation and provide contact information for the individuals or organizations connected to the case so that if you have any tips, you can contact them directly and maybe together we can help solve some cases. Speaking of cases, if you're someone who's interested in true crime, specifically unsolved cases, and you would like to hear my opinion on those investigations, please consider subscribing whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever platform you use, it would be greatly appreciated. All right, for this week's case, it's a little bit of an older investigation. Uh, we're talking about 26 years. So you might be saying, okay, Derek, why are we covering this one? Is there is there much that we can do with it? And this one's a little different because as you will see, it sounds like we may have identified who was responsible for this crime. But the reason I gravitated towards this case is for a couple of reasons. I always try and find a connection to the victims. You don't want to make it personal, but you want to make it relatable. And this week's case was very easy. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my brother uh, is a firefighter. And the victim in this case, Thomas Dorr, was also a volunteer firefighter. So immediately when I saw that, it made me think of my brother. And and what it does for me and what I hope it does for you is reminds you that although these cases can sometimes be fascinating and interesting and the, the mystery of it is what, what makes you come back, it reminds you that they're real, that these are actual people and they're actual family members who've been affected by these crimes. Um, this isn't some made up story. This is real life. And so having that little bit of a connection to it just makes it that much more real for me and makes me that much more passionate about it. And I hope it does the same for you. The other reason I wanted to cover this case is because although it is older, it's still solvable. And I want to keep it in the headlines and I want to expose new people to it. As you will see, uh, Tom's friends and family still come out and celebrate his life each and every year uh, with a vigil. And that's commendable after all these years to still be doing that and to be that consistent. And that just goes to show you what type of person Tom was. And I want to honor him here. And I want to expose you to this case as well so that going forward, you will also know the name Thomas Dorr Sr. With that said, I think we've covered it all. Let's get into it. Thomas Ferdinand Dorr Sr. was a pillar in his community of Pleasantville, New York, a more rural area located 35 miles north of Manhattan. He worked as a manager for the Department of Public Works and as a volunteer firefighter for Engine Company No. 1. Around the fire station, Tom was around six foot seven and was known as the Gentle Giant. Despite his imposing stature, nobody felt intimidated by Tom because he had a heart of gold and was always willing to help anyone in need. Tom was married to Jane Sawyer, a library clerk with a child from a previous relationship. Together, Tom and Jane had a son named Tom Jr. The family settled in a home near Graham Hills Park, which was over 430 acres and known for its mountain bike trails. When Tom wasn't working or spending time with his family, he liked feeding the wild turkeys that lived in the park. No matter the weather, Tom made sure that the turkeys were taken care of. On January 7, 1996, a massive blizzard hit Pleasantville. The Daily Times reported that the historic storm brought 50 mile per hour winds, 
freezing temperatures, and a massive amount of snow, more than two feet in total. It was said to be one of the worst blizzards of the century. At around 5 p.m. that evening, Tom received a call for volunteer firefighters to stay at the firehouse overnight so they could be ready to help with any emergencies caused by the blizzard. Tom agreed to go and said he'd be there soon. Hours passed, but Tom never arrived at the firehouse. At about 8.30 the following morning, Tom's wife Jane called the firehouse looking for Tom, but she was told he wasn't there. According to Jane, this came as a surprise. She thought Tom had been there overnight. She explained that after receiving the call from the fire station the previous evening, Tom told her he was going to stop by Graham Hills Park to feed the turkeys, and then he'd walk to the fire station, which was less than a mile away. Jane said she didn't hear from him again. After learning that Tom never showed up at the firehouse, Tom's family contacted the police to report him missing. As soon as it became clear that something was wrong, a group of firefighters put together a search team and headed to the park. They started their search at the path Tom usually took to feed the turkeys. At around 9.45 a.m., the search party was at the top of the hill, around 150 yards from the door home, when one of the firefighters tripped over something. They cleared two feet of snow and found Tom's body. It was immediately obvious that he had been murdered. His head was bludgeoned, his face was cut up, and his throat was slit. The police were called and investigators combed the area for clues. Unfortunately, the heavy snow made it extremely difficult to gather any evidence. The Journal News reported that investigators were only able to recover a few things, a container of bird seed found in the snow, and Tom's blood, which was spattered on the four trees nearby. The murder weapon, thought to be a knife, was never located. On January 9th, Tom's autopsy was completed. According to court documents, his exact cause of death was, quote, sharp force injuries of the neck, head, larynx, and major blood vessels of the neck, blunt force trauma of the head and chest, and aspiration of blood. Tom's estimated time of death was around 6 p.m. on the 7th, just an hour or so after he got the call from the firehouse asking him to come in. So we're going to dive into this more as we go throughout this case and definitely at the end during the perspective portion but I just want to reiterate what I said there. Uh, this incident where Tom was found, where his body was located, was only about 150 yards from his home. And only about an hour after he got the call, he was still alive at that point. And that's not a big distance, and that's not a big window when you think about it. 150 yards, a little over the length of a football field, and it's in the middle of a blizzard. So probably not too many people outside small window of opportunity where he could have been attacked and not far from his home. And there were other houses in the area. So you would think at that time, uh, if there was an attack, you might have heard something. And again, I'm, I'm foreshadowing a little bit here, but this will all make sense as we go through the case. Police immediately disclosed Tom's cause of death to the public and said the murder weapon was likely a knife, which had not been located. The police further said they hadn't developed any suspects or motives. On the night of January 29th, around 40 of Tom's co-workers and friends held a vigil in the park where Tom's body was found. Jane and her sons did not show up. Over the next few months, reporting on Tom's case dwindled. In late June, the police provided an update. They assured the public that they were still investigating Tom's murder every day. And although they hadn't identified any suspects or motives, they were confident they would be able to solve the case. The district attorney's office also shared that several individuals were not cooperating with the investigation. However, they didn't share the names. The office simply stated, quote, they are individuals who we believe have information that is crucial to this investigation and their lack of full cooperation is presenting a significant obstacle. In October, Crime Stoppers announced that they were offering a $5,000 reward. New posters were handed out and plastered around town. Unfortunately, no one came forward with the information needed to crack open the case. At the one-year anniversary, Tom's friends and co-workers held a vigil to remember Tom. Again, Jane and her sons were not in attendance. The police then spoke to the media about where things stood with the investigation. They said that blood evidence from the scene had been tested, but unfortunately, the results came back inconclusive. Now, you can take a couple things from this. This blood very well may have belonged to Tom but it could also belong to, to his offender or offenders. 
Uh, but when the blood is contaminated, whether that's by the surrounding elements or it also could be the way it was captured by detectives, the way it was uh, put into evidence, if it's not processed properly, it does make it very difficult to get a good sample that would allow you to put it into the database of CODIS. So that's, again, I'm not blaming it on detectives here. It very well may have been the where the blood was, how it was contaminated initially, that just contributed it to being an insufficient sample. But I will say there are cases, may not be in this one, where the way the evidence is seized and how it's preserved could ultimately be the deciding factor as to whether or not that blood evidence or any type of DNA evidence is usable in the future. The police said that they were still actively following leads. However, they were having trouble getting certain people to cooperate. Those people were publicly identified as Tom's wife, Jane Sawyer, and her 26-year-old son, Jeff Dorr. Now, just a reminder, Jeff is Jane's son from a previous relationship. He had been living in the Dorr home when Tom was murdered. And I just want to note here that although Jeff is not Tom's biological son, he adopted his last name Dorr when Jane and Tom got married. The police further revealed that on the same day Tom was found dead, Jane hired an attorney to shield herself and her two sons from questioning. Then months later, they all relocated to Connecticut and Jane decided to go back to her maiden name of Sawyer. When people in the community found out that Jane immediately hired an attorney after her husband was murdered, they were not happy. This reaction surprised Jane. She told the patent trader that she couldn't understand why the community was so upset with her. She said, quote, most people get lawyers. It's not unusual. You see it on TV all the time. I don't know why they got angry that I did that. Jane claimed to have given a full statement to the police and then allowed them to search her home. That wasn't exactly true, but I'll get to that in just a minute. The police didn't release any other information on Jane and Jeff's lack of cooperation, and it would be years before there was any other significant movement in the case. Then, in January of 2001, the police announced that after five years of investigating, they were ready to name two suspects in Tom's murder, Jane Sawyer and Jeff Dorr. The police said they became suspicious of the duo during their interviews on January 8, 1996, the day Tom's body was found. They explained that Jane quickly hired an attorney to protect herself and her sons from questioning, but not until she and her sons had already shared some useful information. During those interviews, it was revealed that Jeff, who was 25 years old at the time of Tom's murder, was dependent on heroin. This caused many arguments between Jeff and Tom, including one that occurred on January 7th. Earlier that day, Jeff ran out of drugs and wanted to go to New York City to buy more. The blizzard made it difficult to travel, so he asked Tom if he could borrow his four-wheel drive vehicle to get there. Tom refused, which led to an argument between the two. But according to Jeff, Tom eventually gave in and said he could use his car. Jane and Jeff said later that day at around 5 p.m., Tom received a call from the fire station asking him to come in. Tom agreed to go, but he told Jane and Jeff that he wanted to stop and feed the turkeys first. They decided to join Tom for the feeding while Tom Jr. stayed home. At around 5.30 p.m., Jane and Jeff started walking with Tom, following his normal path up the hill. But the snow was really deep and it quickly became clear that Jane wouldn't make it to the top of the hill. She and Jeff decided to turn back and go home. Tom said he was going to continue up the hill, feed the turkeys, and then he would go to the fire station. But as we know, Tom never made it. When Jeff and Jane were done giving their accounts of what happened on January 7th, detectives began asking them questions about where Jeff was during the hours after they left Tom at the park. However, their answers didn't match up. When police pointed out the discrepancies, Jane stopped all interviews and hired an attorney. Now I wanna stop for a second here and, and, and talk about the decision to hire an attorney in this moment. You could look at it two ways, okay? And you want to take into consideration all the circumstances. I'm not going to sit here and condemn someone for hiring an attorney. I never will. Never did on Crime Weekly. Won't do here on Detective Perspective. But I do think there are certain situations where if you're telling the truth, there's not necessarily a need for one immediately. Um, but the two arguments could be made, and I'll make them for Jane and Jeff right now. It's not completely out of the realm of possibility that you could have a family member giving a statement, trying to be helpful, and just by not being clear or being nervous, 
they now become a suspect and they maybe say something in the wrong way, which in turn results in them being, you know, a suspect in a, a crime they didn't commit just because their, their mannerisms or the words they say may come off as suspicious. So having that protection there to, to prevent you from doing that, I can understand it. Um, but I would say that in a case where it's your husband, time is of the essence. You want to try to figure this out as soon as possible. It does seem a little odd in this particular case. And I will say the other reason you would hire an attorney would be if you actually did commit the crime and you're nervous that police are aware of it and to prevent them from building a case against you, you invoke your right to an attorney and, and stop all questioning. That is also a possibility. And with that said, probably not a surprise to any of you, this move was very suspicious to police. One detective told Westchester Magazine, quote, in most cases, when you have a beloved family member that was murdered, the family members would bend over backward and be more than cooperative to do whatever they could do to find out who killed their family member. And in this case, it was completely the opposite. After the brief interviews were over, the police looked further into Jane and Jeff. During the investigation, they discovered that Jane and Jeff rarely, if ever, went with Tom on his walks to feed the turkeys. But for some reason, on January 7th, during one of the worst blizzards in history, they chose to go with him. So I think you can see where this is going. And I want to point out that in an investigation, as a detective, you have multiple jobs. Obviously, you want to find the evidence that, that tells the story of what happened. But you also want to rule out possible defenses, right? So in this case, you want to look at the, the circumstances, the history leading up to this event to find out if it was common for a potential suspect to be with the victim during this time frame. Because as you will find in most trials, when it goes to court, the first thing they're going to say is, oh, you know, what's wrong with a wife wanting to go with her husband on a walk? Well, by the detectives doing the investigation the right way, they will be able to prove to the jury that although it's not uncommon for a wife to want to go on a walk with her husband, this particular wife, the one we're talking about here, never did it. And that's important. As my good friend, Dr. Chris Mohandi, always said, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. The police also found out that after Jeff and Jane returned to their home without Tom, Jeff went back into the park alone. At around the same time, he called his friend Mike Sweet. Later that evening, Jeff and Mike drove Tom's vehicle to New York City, presumably to buy drugs. Based on the evidence gathered so far, the police were convinced that Jeff and Jane were involved in Tom's murder, but they weren't sure about much else. The police told Journal News that they didn't know what role Jane and Jeff played in Tom's murder, and they hadn't been able to rule out the possibility that others were involved as well. The police said, quote, Our basic focus is still that three people walked into the woods together that day. Two came out, and the third person was found murdered. We know who those two people were, but the difficulty is the lack of physical evidence. So what do I always say to you guys? It's not always what the police are saying. It's what they're not saying. In this particular situation, if I'm to translate this quote, I think most of you are probably right with me. They're basically saying, hey, listen, it's the middle of a blizzard. We know that three people walked into the park, which was only 150 yards from their home. And two people walked back to the house. The third person ended up dead. And based on the environmental conditions, more than likely there wasn't anybody else in that park. Um, it's hard to believe that in that short window of time and that small geographical location that these two individuals that were with the victim wouldn't have seen or heard something if Tom had been attacked by a, another party. Basically what they're saying, to put it in simple terms, is that they believe Jeff and Jane murdered Tom. They just don't have enough to prove it. According to police... They also weren't sure about the motive behind Tom's murder. They had a theory that the argument over the car might have played a part. They found it hard to believe that Tom would have had a change of heart and allowed Jeff to use his car to buy drugs. Another possible motive was money. The police learned that 18 days after Tom was murdered, Jane filed for his $105,000 life insurance policy, worth more than $200,000 today. As part of the process, Jane's attorney asked the police to provide him with a letter confirming that Jane had not been charged with Tom's murder and that she was not a suspect. The police responded to the letter and said that Jane had not been charged. However, she was a suspect. 
The letter continued, your client has invoked her rights to refuse to speak to or to cooperate with police during the evening hours of January 8, 1996. Your client had, at the same time, an attorney block further questioning of her son, Jeffrey Doerr. Your client, within a short time, also blocked further questioning of her juvenile son, Tom Jr., of which he had legal control, who had been cooperating with the police. If your client and her family care to cooperate and freely discuss the circumstances leading to Mr. Doerr's death, I will be in a position to honor your request or deny it, as the case may be. Until then, further assistance in this matter will not be forthcoming. Now, I have to say, I, I don't take any information that we discuss in these cases lightly, but I did have a little bit of a smirk as I was reading this, this response because we all know what the detective is saying. He, he, he's saying, listen, I think your client killed Mr. Doerr, and if you think I'm going to help you get money for a murder she potentially committed, you're out of your mind. Kudos to the detective. It was very well written, and it opened the door, right? Hey, listen, if she wants to come in here and clear her name and allow her son to clear his name and also allow us to speak to potentially the only actual witness here, we're all for it. We want we want justice in this case, and we would hope that you would as well. And again, I think he's saying what we're all thinking. Uh, he knows that there's no chance at Jane or Jeff coming in and speaking with them. And he's hoping, the detective here, that because they're not going to come in, they won't be entitled to this money. Now, based partly on this letter from the police, the insurance company refused to pay out Tom's life insurance. Jane appealed the denial, and in the end, the company was ordered to give her the money. Uh, that's unfortunate, but that's how it goes sometimes. And uh, the legal system, sometimes it works for you, sometimes it can work against you. The police further found out that two days after Tom was murdered, Jane asked the water department about his benefits, which was worth around $70,000 or $140,000 today. According to court documents, Jane waited just under two months after Tom's murder to officially file for the benefits. At that point, the police had already considered her a suspect, so her application was denied. She appealed the decision and a new hearing was ordered. The hearing had not yet happened when Jane was named as a suspect in early January of 2001. After police announced that Jane and Jeff were suspects, Jane's lawyer spoke to the Journal News and said that when someone goes missing and ends up dead, the police typically consider close relatives, the person who reported the disappearance, and the last person who saw the victim alive as suspects. The attorney explained that because Jane happened to be all three in this case, the police were labeling her as a suspect. The attorney further stated that he told Jane not to discuss the case with anyone. He added, quote, this has been a tragedy for my client as well. It is she who suffers through it on each anniversary. I would just remind people she's a victim as well. Tom's friends and colleagues told the Journal News that they weren't surprised Jane and Jeff were named as suspects. Tom's former fire captain said, quote, Right from the time that we found his body, everybody pretty much agreed there wasn't some vigilante running around town. Everyone knew it had to be someone from the family, but without proof, you didn't say anything. You just had your intuition. One of Tom's friends also said that there was friction between Tom and Jeff and that the door marriage seemed to be, quote, one of convenience rather than love. He said that Tom had been having disagreements with Jane before his death. He explained that in 1995, Tom took a trip to visit his parents in Florida. When he returned home, he started talking about finding a job and relocating there. Jane was not happy about the idea of moving, which led to some heated arguments between them. One firefighter by the name of Larry told Westchester Magazine that Jane's behavior was odd following Tom's murder. He had been with Jane shortly after she was informed that Tom had been found dead. He recalled that her reaction, quote, seemed a little calm and reserved, not what you might expect. Larry further told PIX11 that in the days after Tom's murder, Jane and Jeff didn't seem that upset at all. In fact, they called Tom's firehouse and asked someone to come pick up his uniform and other equipment. Larry volunteered and went to the door home. When he got there, he found Jeff and Jane with the uniform all boxed up and ready to go, and it appeared that they were anxious for him to leave with it. Many of Tom's friends and colleagues told the media that they were hopeful arrests would be made soon. Unfortunately, that never happened. In mid-January 2001, Jane attended an appeal hearing to determine her eligibility for Tom's $70,000 in benefits. A detective investigating Tom's murder was called to testify. He stated that Jane was still a suspect in Tom's murder. When asked how Jane could be ruled out as a suspect, the detective replied, 
quote, the only way we would rule out Jane is if we had evidence someone else committed this crime without her assistance. Okay, so to translate this one for you, what I'm picking up here is detectives aren't necessarily certain that Jane actually killed Tom. They're unsure. They, they think she knows what happened, but they're still open to the possibility that maybe Jeff killed Tom without Jane knowing too much about it beforehand and just covered it up after the fact to protect her son. If that's the case, what they're saying here is, hey, Jane, if you know what happened and you weren't involved, come forward, let us close this case, let us get justice for Tom, and yeah, you're probably still going to be hit with a crime, but it would be a lot lesser of an offense than murder. And so I think they're extending an olive branch here by coming forward and saying, listen, if we got this wrong, Jane, and you weren't involved and you're just, it's a mother's love for her son that's causing you to act this way, well, come forward and tell us that. You still have that opportunity. But again, I, I don't think they're hopeful that that's going to happen after all this time, but at least they're keeping the door open. Following the hearing, a final decision was made to deny paying out the death benefits. Jane would not be receiving any more money stemming from Tom's murder. In the years following the hearing, there were very few updates in the case. Tom's friends and colleagues continued hosting yearly vigils, hoping to keep his name in the public eye. In 2015, Crime Stoppers announced a $6,000 reward, and the police confirmed that Jeff and Jane were still the prime suspects in Tom's murder. One detective said, quote, I'm very confident that these two, and possibly a friend of the stepson, were involved. The detective further alleged that they have reason to believe Jeff and Jane tampered with the crime scene after Tom was murdered. According to CBS News, authorities have enough to charge Jane and Jeff with evidence tampering, however they've chosen not to because it's just a misdemeanor. Instead, they're focusing on building a homicide case. Now, I know some of you might be going back and forth on this one saying, well, if you can get in with something, why not? The reality is it's not going to it's not going to be significant enough to cause any damage. They may not even do any time for this. And is it going to apply any more pressure on them to speak or confess to a homicide? Of course not. So I think ultimately investigators have a goal, which is to find the people responsible for Tom's murder and hold them accountable. And that's their goal to, to work on this misdemeanor case, which is going to essentially be a slap on the wrist. It's a waste of the detective's time and also a waste of the court's time. Um, that's not what's going to bring justice to, to, to Tom. We, we need a, a conviction on the charge of murder if we're really going to get that for him and, and his loved ones. Despite the increased reward, no solid leads were developed. In January of 2019, Crime Stoppers offered an additional $2,500, bringing the total reward to $8,500. In January 2020, a vigil for the 24th anniversary of Tom's murder was held. The police told attendees, quote, Tom Dore is not forgotten and he's more than just a name on a cold case. He deserves respect and dignity. That's why we're taking a hard look at any leads. The police also said they were looking through new leads and additional suspects, as well as utilizing new forensic tools. Now, this was an interesting statement here because through this entire story now, we've been really focused on Jeff and Jane. And I, I go back and forth about how I feel about this statement. Are they saying that as, as investigators had looked at this case over the years, they weren't as certain about Jeff and Jane? Or are they just basically covering their ass here by saying, hey, listen, we're not getting tunnel vision. We're always open to new possibilities, even though we still think Jeff and Jane did this. The other positive is that, as we always talk about in these cases, this is a 26-year-old investigation. So forensics has come a long way since then. So evidence at the time, if preserved correctly, that may not seem significant, may now have critical value because even though it might be a small amount, the technology and science available today may be able to use that minimal amount to make a DNA match. And if that happens where you can put Jeff or Jane at the crime scene at the top of that hill when they said they never made it to the top, um, I think would be significant because they could argue that they've been there before, but it'd be very difficult to explain how their DNA would be so fresh, especially right after a blizzard. January 2023 brought the 27th anniversary of Tom's murder. 
At the annual vigil, Tom's friends and colleagues said they were hopeful that by the next anniversary, they would have an arrest and they could, quote, keep their candles. Now, unfortunately, that's the last update we have in this case. And I want to go over a couple things as far as my perspective, but this one's not going to be that lengthy because I feel like for the most part, it's it's pretty self-explanatory. But we're going to break down the two potential scenarios here and what may be more likely. So the first scenario is that they're going up the hill together, all three of them, Jeff, Jane, and Tom. And as you saw through this episode, if you're watching on YouTube, there's a little bit of like a drawing that we found during the research where you can see where the door house was, where Jeff and Jane allegedly turned around to go back home and where Tom's body was found. It's a small distance away for anyone who's just listening on audio. And in totality, as I mentioned earlier, it's a total of about 150 yards, not much. And then you have the element where on this specific date in question, there was a massive storm. So for the most part, people were not outside walking around. And in my experience, this would not be an ideal time for an offender to be hanging out in the park, hoping that someone's going to walk through and they would be able to rob them. Um, But let's just for the sake of argument, say that were the case. And there was someone in the park who Jeff and Jane did not see. And when Tom was alone, he was attacked. Well, then you're looking at a potential robbery. This would involve this person going up to Tom, maybe saying, hey, give me your money or whatever the case may be. Tom refusing a fight ensuing and then Tom being injured by a knife and um, dying from his wounds. He bleeds out. If that were the case, I would expect to see a different set of injuries. I would expect to see more defensive wounds on Tom's hands, which up to this point, we have no evidence of. What we do have evidence of is that Tom's throat was slit, which suggests to me that Tom did not see this coming. He wasn't prepared for it. And to take it a step further, if he wasn't prepared for it, more than likely his attacker was someone he knew and even trusted. Which brings us to the next scenario. Jeff and Tom had been fighting throughout that night, and there may have even been some premeditation with this because Tom had some benefits, had some money, where a decision was made that Tom was better off dead than alive. And based on what had happened that night, and based on this call coming in from the fire department, and the fact that there wouldn't be a lot of witnesses in the park on that particular evening, a decision was made to kill Tom. If this is the case, I don't know how this would have occurred without Jane's knowledge. We know that the two of them went to the park together with Tom. And if we're going to play this out, more than likely, that's when the murder occurred. Then they go back to the house. Jane stays there. Jeff goes back to alter or clean up the crime scene to avoid it being linked back to them. The other scenario you could have here, just to kind of give Jane an out, is you could have a situation where genuinely, as they were going up the hill, Jane said, I can't make it all the way up the hill. Jeff, knowing what he wants to do, says, I'll bring you back. It's a short walk. He brings her back to the house. Then he says, hey, I'm going to go back up there. You know, I want to be, you know, hang out with Tom. Goes back up the hill, kills Tom, alters the crime scene, and then goes back to the house and and Jane doesn't know anything. She doesn't know anything that happened and everything that we hear about this case after the fact regarding Jane and her calling to speak to Tom, it could all be accurate. The big wrench in that theory is Jane's behavior after Tom's murder, right? We're looking at a situation here where the key witnesses in this case are Jane and Jeff and also Tom Jr. And for Jane, if she wasn't involved, to impede the investigation of her husband's murder doesn't make a lot of sense. I think most people out there would acknowledge that in this case, the spouse would be willing to do everything and anything they could to get answers in their loved one's murder. And it appears here that from almost the very beginning, 
Jane did whatever she could to prevent that from happening. Now, her deciding to, to relocate, I don't necessarily have a problem with because it could be all the pressure that was being applied to her. Whether she's guilty or not, doesn't matter. She just wants to get out of there. Her changing her name, that again, that could be because she knows she's a main suspect and she's trying to live a life. But the going after all the money uh, so quickly when she should be focused on her husband's murder without really even knowing what happened to him, when you couple that information with the evidence or the facts that we do have about the night of Tom's death, it, it's bad. It's not a good look for her. It's not a good look for Jeff. And I feel that's the main reason that detectives have honed in on those two. And I think we'll continue to do so. As far as where we can go with this case from here, there's not much. Detectives feel like they have the people responsible. I do like the fact that they're publicly stating they're still going to be open to other options if something else comes forward that would suggest someone else committed this crime, they're going to explore that avenue. I don't see a world that if Jeff and Jane did commit this crime, they're going to eventually come forward and admit to it. I don't think that's going to happen. So I do think there has to be a conversation at some point internally with the DA and the investigators on this case to decide, hey, what do we have and can we take a shot at this if we're, if we're absolutely positive? How it would play out in trial, I don't know. It, 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 you're talking about a a circumstantial case at best, and there's not a lot here. The only people who really know what happened are, are Jeff, Jane, and Tom, and Tom's no longer with us. So I think at this point, all you can hope for is that with the new forensic technology that we have, there is a, an existing piece of evidence that's currently in an evidence locker at the police department that they can submit for retesting, and hopefully there's something there forensically that can tie at least Jeff or Jane to the crime scene. And I think if they get that, they might take the shot. And that's going to do it from my perspective on this investigation. I wish I had better news. However, there may be somebody out there who's watching or listening right now that has a critical piece of information that could be the missing piece in this puzzle. So anyone with information in Tom's case is asked to call the Westchester County Police at 914 864 77 Zero, zero. Uh, my thoughts, as always, are with Tom's family and friends. Uh, I hope they continue to hold the vigils until we get justice for Tom. And I hope that by covering this case, it promotes what we're all trying to do here, which is hold the people responsible for this crime accountable. Uh, if you guys made it to the end of the video, please uh, comment down below. And as always, like, comment, subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. I will be back next week with another case. Until then, stay safe out there. I'll see you soon.